Thank you very much, Barb. I, I did not intentionally uh, plan it so that you'd have so much to read for the scripture. But the Bible is full of story, and it is through story that oftentimes that we learn. So I'm going to start out with a story this morning about myself. About 50 years ago, my family moved to Martinsburg uh, from Ohio. My brother and I at the time were junior high age. We were in our early teens. We came from a larger city than what is Martinsburg, not a big city, but a larger city. Uh, and we had never had the benefit of living so close to so much game land, to, to, to so much wooded area around. We knew nothing about hunting. A couple of the senior high uh, guys from our church offered my brother and I an opportunity to fit in. They invited us on a hunt so that we could go experience it. How many of you here have been invited to go on a snipe hunt? How many have gone on a snipe hunt? <laughs> a couple of you. For those of you who are not familiar, I, I actually tested it on my son-in-law the other day, and he, he didn't have a clue what a snipe hunt was. And he's in his 40s. Um, a snipe hunt uses no traps, uses no guns, uses no arrows. The group designates a person, or maybe two people, um, to be the, the catchers. They're given sacks, and then they go out into the woods, and they set these two two people beside a tree. And the promise is that these people, these other folks are going to go out and drive the snipe out and drive them your way. And you sit by the tree with the sack, and when a snipe comes by, you throw it over the snipe, and voila, a successful snipe hunt. If you catch the snipe, they said, you'd be able to be one of the few who could proudly mount the snipe onto your wall for all to see, or have it bronzed if you really wanted to. Simple enough concept, I thought. I also uh, wanted to know what a snipe looks like. Well, they said, you'd, you'd know it when you see it. You know it when you see it. In hindsight, that was actually a red flag. But neither my brother nor I saw it. The purpose of a snipe hunt, hunt those of you who are familiar with it um, already know this, a snipe hunt is not about uplifting people to help them feel welcome or fit in. A snipe hunt is a practical joke. They let you sit out in the, in the woods. Fortunately for me, it didn't matter. I didn't go on the snipe hunt. I don't remember if my brother went or not. I'm guessing that he probably took others on snipe hunts in his day. In this game of snipe hunting, what a snipe looks like depends on where you live. In California, a snipe is a small bird. Truly, there really is such a thing as a snipe. It's a small, small bird lives around marshland. In the desert or in the wilderness, wooded areas, um, a snipe may be, among other things, uh, according to Wikipedia, a small poisonous snake. Did you know that Jesus refers to snipe in the Gospel of John? Just as Jesus lifted up the snake in the wilderness, Jesus begins, and then he eases into the lesson that he has for us. In this scripture in John, Jesus has been engaged in teaching by the time we get to verse 14. Nicodemus a political figure, a member of the Jewish ruling council, had asked Jesus a question. He had asked him a question about salvation. What do you mean, Jesus, when you teach that to enter the kingdom of heaven, one must be born again? What does that mean? Jesus had been explaining spiritual rebirth, but Nicodemus was as sharp as the uh, disciples were and as sharp as I am sometimes. He didn't get it right away. So Jesus tried a different tactic to help make his point. Jesus referred to a story of which Nicodemus would have been very familiar. It's a story from the Hebrew Bible, from one of the historical books. Not history books, as we think of history today, but historical books about a time when the Hebrews were in the wilderness. 
They had escaped Egypt and were on the move. They were heading towards a promised land, towards something better, towards a blessed life, not just the existence that they experienced in Egypt. You might call it a pilgrimage, as Pastor Barb spoke about last week. Let me read that story from Numbers once again. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put a pole on it. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole that when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. From this story, can you identify the sniping that's going on? The snipe are not only the venomous snakes that God sent, the word snipe is not only a noun or a descriptor of the small snake, it's also a verb. To snipe means to shoot from a, a concealed location, hence the word sniper. It means also to criticize others, to backstab, gossip negatively, to make underhanded remarks about another. Another term I've heard over the years is to bag someone. Our political discourse today and news commentary is full of sniping and vitriol, full of anger and hatred. The Hebrews in the wilderness were sniping at Moses and at God. They were probably sniping at each other, too, pointing fingers of blame. The snakes God sent give us a visual image of what sniping does. It kills the community. The Hebrews were doing evil. They were condemning Moses, a God-led leader, essentially saying to their leader and to God, you owe us the life that we want. The sniping they were engaged in leads to death, destruction, and I think deconstruction in the manner that some have spun the concept today. But that's just my take. Remember that I'm not a smart man. In the wilderness, God gave the people a way out of the snipe hunt. God had Moses put a bronze snake on a pole and lift it up for all to see. Their salvation only came once they recognized their sin and repented. Looking up to that bronze snake as a reminder of their humanness. In that story of the bronze snake being lifted up, life and salvation did not come by sniping and tearing down. It came from the people's repentance and removal of sniping from their way of being. We're now on the fourth Sunday of Lent. If you remember at the beginning of Lent, about a month ago, you were challenged to give up something in your life. That challenge can be likened to the challenge of the Hebrews who spent time in the wilderness, having given up the relative security of Egypt on a sojourn for a promise of God. What has the last four weeks been like for us, having given up an earthly pleasure for Lent. I'm assuming that you all gave up something for Lent. Most of us were already back in Egypt. We gave up 
having given up something. We want what we want, right? Two or three days of misery doing without that which, with what we want is just too much. It's a reality of life that there are aspects of our lives where we don't have much choice. It's a reality that we experience dark nights or days upon days in a wilderness. Our bodies might start challenging us with broken parts or with organs not functioning. We may not in life be the recipient of the same blessings that others have. Maybe we battle being jealous of people who drive more expensive cars, who live in mansions, people who don't worry about food on the table. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, if we're honest, our suffering in life comes to us because of our own choices. But rather than own them, we project them onto others. We snipe. And we project them onto other people or onto God. That's our human tendency. We snipe over what we see as oppression for unfairness in life. We hide and comfort ourselves with our addictions, not just what you normally think about as being addictions like smoking alcohol, prescriptions and other things like that, but we will, we will comfort ourselves with food, with smartphones, with technology. We'll pleasure our senses and wants. Or like the Hebrews, we try to make ourselves feel better by being negative about others. The snake lifted up by Moses was bronzed. The venom of that snake covered up so that it could not destroy and take life. The bronze covers the iniquity of the people. Lifting up the bronze snake was a reminder for them to watch their P's and Q's, so to speak, to, to speak truth for sure, but without projecting evil, without cutting people down, and without anger at life. By uplifting their eyes to something higher, they were reminded of God with them, even in the wilderness and even in their want. And they were reminded of their place in relationship with God. Jesus' message for Nicodemus and for all of us was that just like the bronze snake, the Son of Man must be lifted up for us to look up and to follow if we desire life. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Verse 15. Jesus is our bronze covering. When we repent of our human sinfulness, look up to him and intentionally, in our own free will, follow his path. Then life is given. And then from verse 15, we get to the core of the message of how Jesus covers us. John 3, 16. Many of you know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Martin Luther referred to this verse as the gospel in miniature, a soundbite capturing the essence of the entire rest of the story. For many Christians, this verse is enough, and it's all the gospel they need to know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you haven't already committed it to your memory, I can't advocate enough for you to do so. It's a verse that defines Christian faith. Like so much of our scripture, so many of our texts, this verse means different things to different people. It seems so straightforward. God loves us so much that he gave Jesus to be a sacrifice 
so that if one only and simply believes it, we'll have eternal salvation. And not only that, some preach, we will have what we want in this life. A look at the original Greek shows that a, a better understanding of the meaning of that verse might be expressed this way. God loves the world, so this is what he did. God's agape, God's love, does not have grades or levels. He doesn't love others more than, than you. Of course, as a young kid, I used to say mommy and daddy loved brother and sister more than they, lo than they loved me. God does not have grades of love. His love extends to everyone, no matter what race, no matter what color of skin, whether you're math capable or not, no matter what gifts you have, you are loved. The measure of that love is not in prosperity, but in blessing, in the enjoyment of life as it is given. And God's love extends in the world beyond just his children. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The original Greek word for world may also mean order. God loves what he has created, the natural order of the world. Perhaps the scripture might mean that by loving the world, loving the order, God loves the cycles of the seasons, the ebb and flow of life, of death, and of the process of creating new life. It might also refer to God loving the order of free will that he designed into creation for us so that believers would need to remember to look up to him once in a while and remember from whence our help comes. Help comes not from government, but from reaching out through individual effort and through community effort, through the body of Christ. God loves the world so that he sent his son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Another concept behind the Greek word translated believes is to entrust. Whoever entrusts their lives to Jesus shall live. Simple belief may end with just a mental exercise. Yes, I believe in you. And then it ends. To entrust yourself to Jesus requires that you do something about it. And to trust the order that God has created. The process of salvation for the Hebrews in the wilderness was to recognize behavior that did not lead to life. To repent of that sin and to look up to God, remembering that it's God who covers our iniquity. Jesus did not change that formula. He made more clear, I think, in his teaching to Nicodemus that we are to look up to God as we view Christ on the cross. But that's not where it ends. Not only do we look at Christ on the cross and look up to him, he calls for us as believers to live in the light. His lesson to Nicodemus ends in verse 21 of John chapter 3. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Live, behave, and speak in God's truth and in the light of the positive rather than in the negativity of sniping. And the last word of John 3, 16 that I'm going to uh, pick on and pull out is the Greek word for eternal life. This word for eternal 
may also be translated as age long. The promise of God is not only in the next life. It's also in this life, here and now. To be able to live joyously, even if your life has the hardships of being in a wilderness. Even if others are doing better than you are. Even if others did things wrong and are, are doing things that cry for justice. Even in the midst of injustice, you don't have to snipe. Look up to the cross, and Jesus has you covered. In Christ's love, you can know your own worth and let go of an understanding of the order of life as being oppressive. In those times when life does not seem fair, look up to the cross and remember for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life.